All right. Hello, everyone. And thank you for joining us tonight um, for our webinar, Journey to the East, Traveling China. I'm Megan, the coordinator of Code Pink's China's Not Our Enemy campaign, which was created in response to the rise in anti-China sentiments in recent years um, and the actions our government has taken to accelerate the new Cold War offensive against Beijing, which includes spending billions, militarizing the Asia-Pacific, utilizing uh, military and e economic coercion to push U.S. interests. Oh, one second, submitting some more. Um, all right, and outright just labeling China anything China does, um, all of which has led to a steep rise in Asian American hate across the country. So our campaign does two things. The first, we try to educate the public how their minds are being shaped for war. And we do this by teaching our audience about China, dismantling the lies being told by the media and our politicians. Um, and informing on the billions of tax dollars being needlessly spent preparing for war with China that nobody wants. Um, and we also do this by teaching about China, China's culture, history, which spans 5,000 years, um, and crippling the paranoia that follows everything China does. Um, and the second thing our campaign does is try to redirect all that energy into a push for peace which is why we emphasize the need for friendship with China for working together on climate justice, nuclear disarmament, poverty alleviation, um, and other extremely important issues today. You know, this, this new world is not one of US global hegemony, it's a multipolar world that requires mutual cooperation. Um, so in November, Copink is gonna be leading a community trip to China, um, and we're gonna be focusing on education, learning about China, and raising up people-to-people -people dialogue. Um, you know, there's there's no better way to, to learn about a country than to go there yourself. Um, there's also, you know, no better way than to learn and curb your own ignorance than by getting outside of your home and, and pursuing what's sometimes uncomfortable. Um, yeah, and so you can learn more about the trip at codepink.org slash travel, or you can send me an email directly at uh, megan at codepink.org. Um, and the second way to learn about a place is by hearing directly from those who have gone, which is the point of our webinar today. Um, so with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Krista Chan. Krista is a proud Chinese American from the Bay Area. She currently resides in Oakland and is involved in Code Pink's San Francisco Bay Area chapter and the China is Not Our Enemy campaign. Thank you for joining us today, Krista. And let me just share my screen real quick. <laughs> All right. All right, take it away, Chris. It's nothing. Um, thanks, Megan. <clears throat> um, and yeah, like Megan said, um, I grew up in the Bay Area, but I do travel to China every so often, um, because I have family in Hong Kong. And back in twenty. I think it was 2012 or 2013, I don't remember the exact year, I spent six months um, studying abroad at Peking University in Beijing. So a lot of the pictures I'm going to show today are from that trip. Um, keep in mind, this was 10 years ago now, and China changes very quickly, but hopefully it'll get some of you excited to visit China. Um, and I really appreciate everyone here for your interest in China. Um, if at any time you want to like pause to ask a travel question, I, I don't mind. I'm happy to answer. Um, but yeah, here are just a couple pictures of, um, life on campus when I was there. Uh, the photo on the left was, it, this, these are classmates of mine. At, I think it was like a student fair at the beginning and then I actually also on the right I participated in a triathlon when I was there um so that's me with other competitors so um when you're in Beijing you'll see a lot of foreign students from all over the world and uh, it's very international city um just like Shanghai and a lot of other big cities and I really recommend people go check out um the Peking University campus when you're there 
I think I have some photos on the next slide, which we can switch to, Megan. Um, yeah, okay, so this photo on the left is a very iconic scene at uh, Peking University. It's called Wei Minghu. Um, so this is a lake right by campus. And I think when you all are there, it's not going to look like this because uh, this photo is from the winter time. Um, but I think everyone will find that uh, there's a pretty good mix of nature in a very or nature and kind of serene places you can escape in a very busy hectic city. Um, on the right, I believe that photo is from the Summer Palace in Beijing. Um, and it's huge. It's like, um, I don't have photos of the um, more historic parts of Summer Palace, but um, it's a lot of fun because you can go and like walk through very serene environments, kind of like this one. Um, and Beijing is like a really, really huge, dense city. Um, so it's nice to find some little park scenic areas to be able to walk around. And we can go to the next slide. Um, okay, so here I kind of wanted to just display different parts of China that I went to. I don't remember your exact itinerary. Um, so I don't know if any of this overlaps, but hopefully just from these few slides, you get an idea of the variety of things you can see in China. So the first two photos with the camel and then the one with the, the yurts, those are from Inner Mongolia. Um, so I did take a little trip to Inner Mongolia where um, I was able to like ride both horses and camels in the same day, um, both on the desert and in the grasslands. Um, and we were able to experience Mongolian culture. So um, one thing that you'll notice traveling around China is just the ethnic diversity and the cultural diversity. Um, so even the landscape and the entire, um, the, the landscape and the food and everything, and even the dialects, you'll hear people speak differently. Um, this photo in the lower left is, uh, it is Qingdao. So if you know Qingdao beer, that's the little pagoda. Um, so really beautiful beach scenery as well. Um, the photo on the bottom is from the Nanjing Memorial. There's a huge memorial in Nanjing um, uh, to come to kind of remember the um, uh, the the Nanjing massacre um, by Japan. And then I believe the photo on the right is um, Xi'an, so um, also another big city um, where you'll see kind of big round a lot of a lot of China has these like big roundabouts with really, really busy traffic, um, kind of like that. And we can go to the next slide. Okay, and then um, one thing I was also able to do um, when I was in Beijing is I actually helped a friend bring some of her university students over to the Tibetan Plateau. Um, so here is a bunch of students from Beijing and we're we're kind of we organized a summer camp with some young Tibetan girls. Um, so it was kind of like an exchange program. We we learned some Tibetan cultural traditions and then um, we also taught them some Han Chinese cultural traditions. So Han Chinese is like the ethnicity of the the, the majority ethnicity in China. And we can go to the next slide. Do I have more? Is this? Oh, I do have more. Okay. Um, another thing um, I just want to point out is just very religious diversity within China. And you can even see this just within a single city. Um, so this photo on the left there is a mosque. Um, so there is very um, rich Muslim history throughout China. You'll see lots of mosques like this. Um, mosques with Chinese characters and whatnot and kind of like a mix of different traditions together. And on the right, I believe that was in Qinghai, which is on the Tibetan plateau. Um, I saw Tibetan temples and art like just so different from anything I had ever seen before. And I just think it's incredible that, you know, you can go 
um, within a short distance and see completely different um, religious relics and institutions um, throughout one country. And is that my last slide? I think it might be. Oh, okay. And then another thing I was trying to think about what are little travel tips I want to give people while you're there. Um, uh, and I just thought of one thing I wanted to recommend is if folks are into massage, um, they have a special type of massage in China called Mangren Amo, which is basically um, blind massage. So it's done exclusively by blind people in China. Um, so you know that your the person massaging you is not able to see. And it is a it's a pretty intense deep tissue massage, and they are very, very detailed about getting every single muscle. Um, and it's actually, I learned from talking to some of the massage therapists there that it's like one of the major employment opportunities that is are available to the blind. Um, so if anyone is into massage and you have a chance, I highly recommend booking yourself an appointment. Okay, that's my little spiel about China. Happy to answer more questions. Thanks, Krista. Yeah, if you have any questions for Krista, you can just put them in the chat and we'll come back around to that at the end. Um, yeah, so next I would like to introduce Code Paint Code founder Jody Evans to talk about her time traveling in China. Jody, take it away. Um, thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, great to see you. Great to have you here. Um, so I just want to start by saying I started really traveling to China in 2019. I went five times in uh, uh, eight months. And it is from that trip that um, China's Not Our Enemy was born because when I would come back each time, I would post all the photos on my Facebook page and people go, wow, I can't wait to go. That's so amazing. Wow, wow. And come January, 2020, when I posted, everybody was like, oh, China, no, China, no. Why would you be posting anything from China? It was like uh, the, it was, you know, this is what happens with propaganda. And so it was when I realized, oh my God, the propaganda machine is pointed towards China now. Does that mean we're going to go to war in China? So um, also just wanted to check, did you want to record this, Megan? Yes. Uh, it's recording. Okay, great. Um, so uh, it, was, it was really like seeing China, sharing China, and just be blown away by every time I went, like the little scratch that you would get and it, never your foot steps there twice, especially like, you know, Krista said in time, but time uh, and even how vast it is to be able to uh, find your way there. So I just wanna say it always delights traveling in China. And um, I just thought this these pink boats were super special in the sense of, um, the play, the the delightfulness that it seems that the culture looks forward to and creates. And then um, always, you know, the the beauty that is so available in nature. Next. So this is one of my favorite places in China. It is over by Burma and it is... Uh, fourth century capital of uh, of Myanmar from the fourth century. And mm -hmm. they have like a, a, a pond where Genghis Khan's son came and watered his horses. It's got tons and tons of history. But why I like Dali is it's a really great place to understand what's happening in China in the last decade. So this area that you're looking at was a disaster area. It was environmentally destroyed. It, um, the people were living in, in a lot of poverty. It was one of the places where poverty alleviation was focusing. And um, it has a lake that I don't have a picture of that was so toxic people were dying from drinking out of it. And so uh, she paid attention, like here was a place where we could pull everyone out of poverty, we could give nature back its vibrancy and um, and create uh, beauty, uh, which 
there's a campaign that he started, um, uh, uh, which is about lovely rivers and and mountains, which is the idea of bringing back the water and the mountains. And you know, you think mountains don't get um, polluted, but these mountains are really great for climbing and climbers from all over Europe uh, made their way here. And it's kind of the way that if you don't demand the visitors take good care of the place, they will trash it. So this um, mountain is now um, a biodiversity space. People aren't allowed to climb on it anymore, yet it's quite beautiful and the entire mountain flowers. So they have a, a funicular that takes you up and then you can walk on these designated paths to be inside of it and to get to four to uh, 12,000 feet, um, sorry, 9,000 feet. And um, yet you are not in, in it, destroying it, breaking it down. Um, and it's been able to come back lush and vibrant. And the photos of before and after are quite um, staggering. Next. And one of the things they do in Delhi is grow flowers. This is a 67 acre flower garden park. And many people, you know, a big thing about China is getting married and wedding pictures. <laughs> and so whenever you were at someplace very beautiful, people are getting their photos taken for their weddings. It's a, it's a big thing about weddings is the photo. And they're all very, they're always in nature. And so all these very um, nature, be you know, beautiful spaces in nature, you can always find the, the wedding photo um, happening. But um, this is what I call a commons that we call in the local peace economy, where it's given to the community. You just come, you can walk, take a stroll, but instead of a park like some of the other parks you'll see, it's a park of flowers that in different seasons is in, um, in bloom. And one of the things that Dalhi is very famous for are roses. And I still have the roses I bought there that are still as pungent and amazing as the day I bought them. I don't know what they do, um, but when, you know, they make cakes out of roses, they sell rose petals. And this is also, Dalhi is very near where Pu'er tea comes from. It's up in those mountains of the Pu'er tea and much of um, some of the most famous and potent uh, Chinese herbs. So here's Sonia. So this is like, that's the mountains where I said, you're like at 9,000 feet and here is sea level. And my husband is Jamaican and this is the exact latitude of Jamaica in China. It, I call it Miami beach, which frustrates him at, to no end, but it, it reminds me of Miami beach because it's, you know, beautiful. It's just tons and tons of people want to live there. And one of the things in poverty alleviation was that in the really northern parts of China, there was no way to develop so that it could pull some of the people out of poverty. It's super cold and brutal, brutal, and not a lot of water and not a lot of agriculture. So um, quite a few people in some of those really harsh regions were brought to um, Sanya. It's an island of uh, 9 million, which is, it's three times the size of Jamaica and three times the population. So the same yeah. population density as Jamaica, but, and very different, you know, so this is Sonia. It's the very bottom of the island, the south of the island, at the north of the island where it's, you know, just um, a boat ride away from the mainland is a giant city with, with ports and there's a lot of trading that happens there, a lot of, um, uh, distribution of, of um, goods goes through Haiku, which is at the very top of the island. I took the train around the entire island one day just so I could get it to see it. And I love high speed trains. And it is very rich and dense in um, agriculture and, uh, and, and nature. And it's just super lush, kind of like Jamaica. And there's a commitment from a national commitment that this be a cared for space. So there's lots of rules about what you can do and what you can't do and how the nature itself will be cared for. But from right, you know, from this bay that you're looking at, 
um, within an hour and a half, there's something like 30 um, major hikes. Uh, Chinese love to hike, they love nature. And they're, they range from, you know, not so hard to like super difficult. And one is you hike up and you're on a glass bridge that goes across a, cre a, 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 cre a, a crevasse, you know? So um, they build really interesting <laughs> ways for everyone to be able to access. Uh, also, I was really blown away by the um, capacity to access no matter your age or your disabilities or, um, you know, what, what limits you. They're trying to serve everyone and make sure that it's a fun experience for all, you know, always catering to the entire family, young and old together. Next. Pink is it in China. <laughs> so uh, everywhere you go, there's pink. It's very popular. So could pink feels very at home in China. Next. And also what I find there are, you know, the women are, just super supportive and love to have conversations about politics and the world and life and um and they're uh, you know really uh fascinated by what they can create and cultivate and um i excuses cannot wait to see what that fire throughout the happy to see mark andrews um so what um you know when we hear that it's a, uh, a dictatorship and all of that is just like the lip, the freedom of women that I find and, and their capacity to explore themselves and their, what what wants to come out of them and to travel beyond the, the narrow walls that I you know see women given in the United States is really fascinating and courageous. And, and I loved their always very honest questions and their reflections on their own lives that I find, you know, super refreshing um, and interesting. Um, next. <laughs> so, Jessa. Um, wow, pretty <laughs> amazing. <laughs> so the other thing about China is this, these are three different provinces. So I just, it's not one province. These are three different provinces and it's dress up is it. And, um, you know, as, Krista was saying there are lots of ethnic minorities in China and they are really proud of their ethnic minority and of its culture. And so you, you know, dress up is happening. And I just basically like in the subway, um, unfairly, the dress up with the, um, the Cinderella was, it was uh, um, Halloween, but I didn't know they had Halloween um, in China. So these are a few people that were, there's a very hip, cool place where I go to get my coffee. And it was at that like hip, cool young space where um, a bunch of them are dressed up in Halloween. Um, but it's not in just one province. In some where there are a, 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 a majority of um, ethnic minorities, you will see the dress up much, much more and much more available um, for yourself to be able to go in and dress up. Next, more pink. Pink is everywhere. Just the bench on the on the bund. Um, but every time I look, there's a, there's a pink catching my eye. Next. So, um, like Chris was saying, it's all about the parks. Um, in in the major cities, everywhere I have been. There are just these profoundly beautiful parks. And these are, again, three different cities. And you see um, the, uh, the, the one on the far right is Beijing and it's right outside the Great Wall before you go to the Great Wall um, on the grounds of an IM Pei Hotel that was built in the 70s. Um, you can see the modern out there, but the peace and serenity and harmony um, that is intended in all these parks that uh, I've decided there must be 10 million gardeners in China because of all the parks and all the upkeep and how perfectly upkeep kept they are, but also how each has its own personality and difference and care. And I would say that even some parks that I've gone back and visited now, you know, five years later, it's like, totally different. 
Um, and also in the seasons, they're totally different. So it also feels like it's a place where someone gets to be creative and um, the teams are amazing when I watch them work and care and the joy of everybody like working in them and talking to you and also the joy of the cats that live in the parks. <laughs> Next, wild cats everywhere. Um, just some more of the parks, you know, the, the old and the new um, trees abound. So you can definitely do some um, tree bathing uh, in, inside the city even. Next. And I just, you know, the old and new harmony, the, the sense of respect and care. And I, I just want to, like, what this photo says to me is what we see missing in the United States and you know what we see missing as we're looking in Gaza is I don't want to live in a culture that doesn't care for the earth and doesn't care for the community and doesn't care for beauty and doesn't like have an even understanding of harmony. And I think what we see in China is that the understanding of harmony, it's not a word too much. We live in the United States, we live drowning in words, I call them proxies, instead of the actual experience. And so what it is like to be in the actual experience of this park, to be in the wonder it elicits from you, because you'll walk across the bridge and see one thing, you'll be um, in, a, in the forest and see another thing and feel another thing. You can either feel the difference in temperature um, from the different places you're walking within it, even the smells change. So, um, for me, this is the understanding of um, the care and um, and also that it's not locked up. Um, and I guess I should bring up right now that everyone feels safe, um, that there's a sense of safety and security everywhere you go. So that also gives the beauty a sense of um, accessibility and um, that you can go anytime I walk in the parks at two o'clock in the morning. Um, next. So this is in um, Shanghai. And um, one of the things I thought somebody else would share, I think um, probably um, Megan will share, but Shanghai is known for the Bund, which is the path that goes around the city. Um, and you've got the two sides of the Bund and the river. And so this is way far down the Bund. And I've made my way, like, I think I've covered 25 miles of the Bund, <laughs> of the whole river walk. And I just got to this one on my last trip. And this was a disaster zone. This was where manufacturing had happened. The ground was destroyed. You know, everything was destroyed. And what they've done is brought it back to campsites. And so, I mean, I walked an entire day through this. That, so it goes on and on and on walks. And you uh, arrange on an app to have one of the platforms and that's where you can camp. You see everyone pulling their little uh, trolley uh, filled with all kinds of things. I mean, I saw blow up couches. The creativity in the camping is quite profound and also just the joy of being together. And there's um, a restaurant that, there's a couple of restaurants like every, I mean, hour, I guess, in my walking and they were feeding I mean, thousands, like probably a thousand people ate while I was there for lunch. It was moving people in and out. It was really actually good food. It had all kinds of rooms that you could pick. It was it was quite the experience of, <laughs> of uh, delicious, delightful eating, but feeding a lot of people that were not anywhere near food. And, you know, lots of people were barbecuing and had their own food, but it also realized that it could serve those that didn't have that capacity to bring everything with them. So as I said, like thinking about everyone's needs and what's available and lots of vegetarian choices. I mean, I would say it's the place to be a vegetarian also is China. That That's not never lacking, no matter where you are. Next. Um, here's just some, you know, a little more of, um, Oh, that one got really cut off. Um, that's a big tent that goes to that other side that you can't see. Um, but yeah, this is an example where I saw a lot of young people. Um, they were playing card games. They look, they see they brought their bicycle. Uh, the, the creativity 
of these places it was really wild. I wanna, um, I guess it doesn't do it like, um, scooters, uh, um, it's, you just, um, <laughs> it's easy, it's easy to find. It's just at the end of the Bund and, um, uh, I, you know, I'll be able to, I, I'll give you the um, subway stop because we took the subway. Um, okay, next. There you go, just to get a better sense of it and all the camping. Um, next. Um, <laughs> more dress up, but this is dress up like in, you know, in the subway, in the street, it just the casualness, even of the community witnessing, it's not a big deal, it's very, you know, just part of the culture. Next. Oops, I lost most of my old and new. Um, but yeah, the old and the new. So <laughs> I love them dressing up in their iPhones. You know, it's just like there, there's no uh, contradiction with the old and the new for them. Next. Okay, that's me. I'm done. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Jody. Um, and yeah, leave any questions that you have for Jody in the chat and she'll answer them at the end. But before we go to questions, I'd like to talk a little bit about my own personal experience traveling in China. Um, so I was fortunate enough to spend a year living in Shanghai from 2018 to 2019, um, which allowed me to travel a bit around the country. But to start, I'd like to talk about what it was like to live in Shanghai. And I thought there's no really better way than to show you this little mini photo series that I took um, on my Instagram way back then. I called it a day in the life Shanghai edition. Um, so I lived half a year in Pudong, half a year in Pushi, and I really got a taste for both sides, the old and the new, um, but I really loved Pushi and that's where this is. Um, as you can see, the streets are stunning. Um, and this here was the fruit shop by my apartment, which I went to nearly every day. And this is a photo on the right of the fruit man that I bought all my fruit from. And I miss this place all the time because the fruit in China was actually the best fruit I've ever had, especially the oranges. I've never had an orange like it since. Um, but yeah, so after getting my fruit and my oranges, I hop on the metro. And as you can see, uh, the doors close so nobody falls in. It's very safe, clean, orderly, clean, on time, clean, and yeah. You get it. Over here on the right, I'm just romanticizing the other passengers because it's fun. Um, so I got off at Nanjing Lu, where I immediately went to a bookstore and bought a book and then a coffee shop, which Shanghai has some of the best coffee shops I've ever been to. Um, and I read the book and that was just kind of like my constant routine when I had free time. Um, and after that, I walked around and discovered a Dippin' Dots store, which I was so excited about because I love Dippin' Dots. And then I met up with my friend Diana at the Bund um, that Jody was talking about. You can see a little bit of the pathway in the city skyline. Um, and we got some mo bikes to bike around, mostly just for fun. We loved riding the mo bikes. They're super cheap and convenient and you, you they're everywhere. Like you never have to be afraid that you're going to get stranded on one. Um, and so after that, we went to Tianzifeng at night. It's a pretty lively area um and the super interesting store big pink I don't know if it's still there um but if it is it's super code pink coded and we'll have to stop by on our community trip um and then I decided to get my ears pierced which was great they did it in the healthiest way with a needle and they were super kind and yeah it was a good experience so that was a day in my life in Shanghai um it's fairly normal but I but sometimes I think people have a vision of China that doesn't really fit the reality in any way um I refused to fly back the entire year I was there. So my parents were forced to come visit me while I was there. Um, and they were all very surprised by things that they didn't even think to consider, like how clean and safe it felt, how convenient the public transportation was, the incredible coffee shops, the unique locally owned stores, the beauty of every single park, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think China is really in another realm when it comes to city infrastructure, which is clear to see. And now, you know, living in DC where public transit is terribly connected and buses randomly don't show up and the shared bikes are untrustworthy and the parks are pretty mid and there's no fruit stands with awesome fruit man. Like I miss it a lot. Um, but anyway, moving on, I will share a bit about my experience traveling around China and some of the things that really stood out to me. So one of the first things that stood out was this extreme contrast between China's cities and nature. 
Um, many of China's cities are super developed, like Shanghai, and now are even considered high-tech cities like Shenzhen, which we'll be going to um, if for anyone who's going on the community trip. Um, and Shenzhen's also known for being a green city. All its public transportation is electric um, because, you know, China has in recent years been implementing many climate initiatives to become carbon neutral by 2050. Um, in fact, China is actually a leading country in the world now when it comes to green initiatives, which most people don't know. Um, and if you want to learn more about that, we have a webinar next week called The Rise of Green China. But so China has these amazing, incredible cities that surpass most city expectations, especially when U.S. cities are all you've known. Um, but it also has this extreme other side than the natural side, um, which also surpassed so many of my expectations. Um, the photo on the right I took in the Yunnan province. Uh, which is in southwest China, uh, borders Myanmar and has a lot of cultural influences from that area. Um, and this particular area is called the Tiger Leaping Gorge. Um, and photos will never do it justice, but um, one of my favorite parts about traveling China was the beautiful nature, the mountains and the gorges and the rivers. Uh, it's like transporting to a completely different world and so worth traveling to just for the nature, which is incredible to say because China has so much else to offer too. Um, the next thing that stood out to me was how incredibly well connected the entire country is. And China is a huge country, but um, they've really put an emphasis the past couple of decades on providing re reliable infrastructure for many of its citizens um, so that can, they can get easily around the country. And, and many of these trains are high speed trains, which cuts the travel time like immensely. Um, and every year China builds more rails. Uh, I think just recently they connected a high speed train from Hong Kong to Shanghai, which half to the travel time. Um, and they're all uh, affordable too, especially compared to the cost of trains in the US. And I wonder sometimes if the US will ever manage to build a high speed rail in my lifetime, it would be really convenient, but I'm not sure that's gonna happen anytime soon. Um, but this particular photo in the middle was taken after I got off the train from Shanghai to Fengsheng, I took an overnight um, one and Fengsheng is the Yellow Mountains. Uh, it's a really popular mountain range to hike. And the one on the far right, was taken on an overnight train from Kunming. So my friend and I brought a bottle of wine, but we forgot to bring an opener. Um, and this man that we had randomly met and the train conductor lady helped open it for us. And then we all shared a cup, um, which is a very China thing to happen. Um, there's a very community feel and everyone helps each other and is normally like super kind and polite. Um, wherever, like wherever I traveled around, I had ex an experience like that, so. Yeah, so I was really interested in religion in China, and I actually got the chance to take a class on religion, um, and every week we took a different field trip to religious sites around Shanghai. Um, so there's, in Shanghai, there's Confucius temples, Buddhist temples, Catholic churches, Christian churches, synagogues, mosques. The people in China uh, enjoy the freedom of religion, and I experienced firsthand um, by visiting and talking to the the worshipers there. I conducted interviews because I had to write like reports back on each field trip and I remember being surprised in particular by the um by the church like the views express I would consider like pretty conservative um like more like you would find in the south of the U.S. and that's of course not universal but it just goes to show like the diversity of religion um and then the diversity within religion as well can you mute yourself thank you um, and Shanghai, in particular, has an entire Jewish quarter because it has a, a history of being one of the sole safe places for Jews during World War II while they were being persecuted. So many fled to Shanghai, um, I think around 20,000 or so, and they were welcomed peacefully by the Chinese people. Um, and you can really see that influence in the city still. There are so many uh, Jewish families that live and worship there today. So... It's pretty futile to attempt to succinctly portray Chinese history and culture, but obviously when you travel there, um, you're exposed to it in ways you've never been exposed to it before. You know, learning about the history of China is a lot different when you're actually in China. It adds a whole new dimension that you miss when just reading about it in a textbook. Um, and of course, Chinese culture is profoundly unique um, and it differs to across the country. Like we've talked about, there are over I believe 52 Minzu ethnicities and each have their own stories and foods and dialects. Um, and I especially loved being in China during the holidays, like the Mid-Autumn Festival, which is coming up soon and Chinese New Year. 
uh, it was so cool to just experience the environment in person with the lights and the food and the excitement. And the food was amazing too. Like on the bottom right are street noodles I had, I think in Wuhan. Um, and that was some of the best noodles I've ever had in my life. Never forgo street food out of fear, trust me. Um, and the top right was taken, I believe in Wuhan as well, which was a little local place that some of the older folk go to play mahjong, which is a popular Chinese game. Um, and another thing about China is that the older folks are always doing stuff. They are so active, whether it be playing mahjong or dancing in the parks, or on the street, there's always a group of older folks doing some fitness activity when you go outside um, because they know how important it is to their health. And it's also just like a really fun way to socialize. And the bottom left, of course, is a photo of my friend, Diana with Mazadong. Um, this was taken in Zhujiajiao, ancient water town, which is on the borders of Shanghai, which is another place that our community ship will be going. Um, and then there's the Great Wall at the top left, of course, and the panda making friends. Yeah, so this was one of my favorite things about traveling in China, and that was how friendly everyone was. And part of it is because you're a foreigner, and that's interesting to know, I think, because there's no anti-China sentiments in, uh, sorry, anti-America sentiments um, in China in any capacity. They are, in fact, excited to encounter American tourists. And many really love the U.S. and find it an interesting place. Um, but I have an extensive collection of selfies with locals just because of how, how friendly they were, how many just randomly approached me and started conversations. And the left two photos were taken at Wuhan University. I went during cherry blossom season. And those two ladies I stayed in contact with for years. Um, they're always sending me messages, blessing me and my family with health and success. And we talked a little bit during the pandemic, too. Um, they told me like what was happening in Wuhan and that would, they were fine and safe. Um, and the lady on the right, far right, was another friend we made in Kunming. We called her our Chinese mom. She was so sweet. In the center, this photo was taken at Mulan Shan, which my friend and I got sort of stranded at. And the girl in the photo and her family ended up giving us a ride all the way back to the airport, which was at least an hour and a half. Um, and that was fairly normal for us by then, the extent that strangers went to help us when we were in need. Um, it's just another one of those moments that a person went out of their way in a way that I've very rarely experienced while traveling in any other country. All right. So lastly, peace. Um, I found that I was really taken by this atmosphere of peace. And this is something that's uh, really impossible to describe, but there's this lightness I felt in China. And I think it has something to do with the, the harmony, um, but it's like, that feeling when you go into a church or a bookstore or a sacred space and the air around you kind of settles um, and perhaps it's just this amalgamation of the long culture of peace, the contentment of the people, um, the ancient history, the lack of crime, the beautiful spaces, the feelings of harmony and connection with nature. Um, but it was very real, the stillness, especially after living in New York City and Washington, D.C. and London, even where everything is a, is a rush, like everyone's in constant pursuit of something and constant competition. That stillness really stands out even now when I think back on it, it just makes me <laughs> want to return. So with that. Oh, and this final photo is a um, when I went to a, a noodle restaurant and the chef came out to eat her her dinner with me. That was a really cute moment. But with that, I'm not sure if there was any questions in the chat that I didn't see. There was a question about healthcare in China. Um, and uh, it's amazing. Uh, it's available, you know, what I, what's fascinating about it is that uh, it's very efficient. So you go in, you get the test, you move to the next test, you move to the next test, you move, and you move through being wherever you need to go for whatever's wrong quite quickly. And every time I've had something, they know what they're doing, you get there and um, the, the the process isn't painful and it's kind of fun um, I mean even in Delhi you know which is in the middle of nowhere I got something in my eye and there must have been I don't know 60 people in the waiting room and we got through very very quickly but everybody's having a great time chatting away playing games um you know full of kids so it's also a super community uh space but 
I I have to say, you know, we've had a ton of people come to China from all over the world and leave uh, better than they came, healthier and and much better than they came. Yes. Yeah, and maybe Krista, if you want to talk about and like uh, Chinese traditional medicine, um, I feel like China has a you know an, uh it's a more universal approach to to taking care of the body. Um, yeah, I've actually never um, seen a traditional Chinese medicine doctor in China before. Um, but I mean, both Western medicine and Eastern medicine are available there. So um, if you get hurt or get sick and you go to a regular hospital, you will get treated a lot like you would in the U.S., but the bill will be cheaper and um, it will likely be a lot faster. Um I've gone to a hospital myself in China and every experience I've heard of there, everyone is like just fascinated by how efficient they are. I will say that the healthcare culture in China is there is not as much of, at least um, in the Western hospitals in China, there is not as much of a culture of them ex explaining a lot of your condition to you um, because they kind of like want to help get you in and out very quickly. Um, I think if anyone is interested in Chinese medicine, it's a great place to learn about different herbs. A lot of the food, like in, in Chinese culture, the, the delineation between food and medicine is not as strong. So a lot of times if you're having a certain soup or if you're having a certain dish, people might tell you like, oh, this has a certain herb that has this certain medicinal properties. Or if you're feeling really hot one day, the people will say, oh, try this tea. Um, so if, if anyone is into like herbology and plants, I think it's a really great place to explore that and ask about it when you're in China. Um, yeah, and I guess to answer um, your question, Elizabeth, about any um, negative experiences, I mean, I think like even though I'm Chinese, I grew up in the U.S. So, so even going to China, like I, I experienced culture shock, like the same way I would in a lot of places. Um, so, and I think, and for sure, like, I mean, I don't look visibly foreign, but I think a lot of people, they might want to take a picture with you or <laughs> if they, if they, maybe they've like never seen a white person or sometimes they, um, Sometimes, so they're very bold about asking you to take pictures. And I would even sometimes have people on the street say like, oh, I think you look pretty or can I take a picture with you? Um, so some people might not feel so comfortable with that because people are so bold about that. Um, so there's going to be little interactions like that where you might get taken off guard. Um, and I think it's, anyone who has traveled significantly to other countries might be used to something like that but it, it can be a shock at first for sure and I think another thing that I, I've heard has changed a lot more at least when I was in China there was not as much of a culture of lining up like Beijing was so crowded that a lot of times like ordering food at really crowded markets and everything it was just it kind of like New York City a culture of people just they need to be aggressive and go get what they want um I've heard that that's changed a little more because I haven't been back in a long time but that if you're not used to really big intense cities like that like bigger than any city here in the U.S. that can also be pretty shocking yeah and like rush hour getting on the train is it's so dense that it, for sure, like that can be overwhelming as well, but it's it's definitely cleaner and there are more frequent trains, but there's also a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah, to add to um, what Krista was talking about, I remember when, when I first got to Shanghai and in Shanghai, it's, it's, um, it's less, it's a very uh, expat filled city, very um, lots of foreigners there. But I remember feeling very self-aware because I had just gone from like the anonymity of being in New York where like nobody looks at you, nobody cares about you to like suddenly being like seen more. Like, I don't know. I had that, you know, the fear of being seen. But I it, it sort of it went away really quickly because I 
I felt that it was more of um a blessing than anything like I got the opportunity to talk to locals so much more because they would come up and approach me and um I got into the habit of adding them on WeChat which is like the the it's like the WhatsApp but for China it's like they use it for social media and talking and paying for stuff um so then I could stay in contact with them and they'd send me the selfies that they took we took together um and it was just it became like a way to make friends um which which um, I loved and uh, stay, still stay in contact with some. Um, but for those who are not comfortable with that, um, it, it can be, I guess, uh, maybe a little uncomfortable. Um, but everyone is always very polite about it, in my experience. Um, and you can say no. You can say no yeah. to like any celebrity. <laughs> um, I think, you know, just to play off on that, there, there's an engagement that I find the culture has that um, when I come back, I, I, I miss it because it's engaged, you know, like, like they both said, like you're somewhere and you're having an engagement. I can go a whole day traveling in the United States and I'm not having an engagement with anyone, <laughs> you know, just getting anybody to stop and acknowledge you exist is, uh, is, you know, hard, but People, no matter where you go, and they'll say nice things to you and be curious, but it, it's not a platitude. It's actually a, an engagement, like that you're just, it's always interesting what people have to say. And then the other thing is the, um, the tenor of the conversation and its bite. So it could be, yeah, that, 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 you know, and I think, oh my God, they're mad at each other, but they're not, they're just having a conversation and it's very heightened. It's very energized and it's got way more on it than I I've understood from my friends. I'm with them like, oh my God, is everybody okay? And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just how it works here. So it's that same thing that's happening in the conversation happens in the engagement. There's no like filter um it's it, there's less filters i would say between you and the other there because people aren't afraid they're like curious they're relational and um they don't there's not a sense of oh i i have to um watch myself there's more the curiosity is the stronger front runner than um i shouldn't engage and that you'll run into in all kinds of different ways yeah. And for the question, how clean, dirty was the air? Um, when I went, when I was in Beijing, I remember there being some air quality uh, warnings, but I know, um, I haven't been there since, but I know they've done a lot of work to clean the air since and that it's much, much uh, cleaner than it used to be. Um, so that's something that I'm looking forward to experiencing. Well, I watch it every night because um, my husband and I, um, like it's a challenge of who's got the better air that we're breathing. And I would say he's breathing better air than me in LA. <laughs> he wins a lot. I have to go somewhere else to win. Um, so in Shanghai and Beijing where it was really, really bad, they did what they needed to do to get it good. Beijing has the harder problem because they have uh, sandstorms that hit Beijing. So it's not so much the pollution, but the sandstorms um, that cause the air to um, get uh, dirtier and not as clear. But I don't know, the last five years, um, Shanghai's, you know, blue skies have been really blue and beautiful. And it's been very rare when it's the air quality has been over a hundred, which is still not in a danger zone. Um, like I can't, I think I saw it once. Yeah. Um, and Marcella, I, for the questions about language, I speak a little Chinese and it's definitely really helpful. Like, especially even in Shanghai, but like anywhere outside of Shanghai. Um, but for any of the, any of the people going on the trip, I'm going to be doing a little Chinese language class for us to just to give you all the words that I think you need to know, the ones that you're going to use the most. <laughs> so don't fear. And it's it'll, it'll be so much fun to use them because it's so satisfying to even have uh, just like a little bit of a conversation. Also, everybody's got yeah. a phone and 
they're very used to the talking into their phone, showing you what it says and you talking back and them reading it. It's a, it's part of the culture now. Um, so that's just normal. Yeah. I also wanted to add, like, even amongst locals, a lot of people have trouble understanding each other because Chinese dialects can vary a lot. Um, so people are quite used to not being understood or having to translate. Um, so that's the nice thing. And I, if you meet, like, if you happen to meet a young person who's learning English, I think they'll be very excited to meet you. Yeah, I remember being really confused with Shanghainese. It's like got that, that R sound that the Beijing doesn't have. But yeah. Can it be? Thanks everyone for joining. Yes, I guess. Oh, yep. It's time to wrap up. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, and for all the great questions. And no, you can take all your technology, never a problem. Um, we will teach you how to download a VPN, which will be useful. Um, and uh, I've never been harassed as a US visitor um, or on the way coming back. I definitely coming back from North Korea, I was held for nine hours, but not from China. Wow, all right. Well, thank you everyone. <laughs> thank you. Thanks have for coming everyone. <laughs> Thanks, Krista. Thanks, Krista. Thanks, Megan. You're welcome. Bye. Bye Thank you.